Why are national park rangers afraid of the deep woods? The northeastern United States is ground zero for a remarkable amount of American history. In fact, it was here that some of the most decisive moments coalesced to make the country what it is today. Events which changed colonists loyal to the British crown into some of America's most revered patriotic figures. It was only a matter of time until protected land was established to preserve both this history and the rich wilderness found within the region. Four of the top 10 U.S. states with the most state parks can be found in the Northeast, ensuring access for generations to come. Alongside this more conventional history, the Northeastern United States also boasts a paranormal pedigree unlike anywhere else. This region's robust ghost story traditions are immortalized in the American imagination in tales by Washington Irving like The Legend of Sleepy Hollow and Rip Van Winkle, bits of fiction which drew upon the land's storied supernatural past, from the birth of spiritualism at the hands of the infamous Fox Sisters in the 19th century to modern waves of UFO sightings, the high peaks, dark forest, and lonely battlefields of the northeastern United States they are home to countless tales of terrifying encounters. Rangers working at the region's many state and national parks seem to encounter these phenomena more than anyone else. In 1869, a construction was completed on Fort Knox, a military outpost in Prospect, Maine. This portion of the country had been mired in an anti-British sentiment beginning with a resounding defeat of colonial forces there in 1779. Until the attack on Pearl Harbor, the British victory over the Penobscot expedition was the worst naval defeat in America's history, with 43 ships sunk and 500 casualties. The disdain that those who lived in Maine felt for the British only grew over subsequent conflicts like the War of 1812 and the Aroostook War, which pitted them against English forces in Canada. This sentiment was a primary motivation behind the construction of Fort Knox. The fort took roughly 25 years to complete and left the region with a massive, expensive military base at the mouth of the Penobscot River. Their efforts, however, were misspent. No significant conflict with the British ever rose again, and no soldier was ever called to defend the ramparts of Fort Knox. Over the years, the garrison was progressively drawn down until custody of the fort was left to a single individual, dubbed the Keeper of the Fort. The final caretaker was Sergeant Leopold Hagee, whose 13-year watch came to an end when people noticed one day that the flag had not been raised above the fort. He was found dead in his home across the road on July 17, 1900. Dead, that is, but not gone. Reports that Hagee still wanders Fort Knox, historic site, come from visitors and employees alike. In October of 2008, tower and gate attendant Teddy Cook was closing up the fort after a Halloween event when he caught sight of a leg moving down one of the structure's many hallways. At first, he thought it was one of the event attendees, lingering after the celebration had concluded. A cook called out to let whoever it was know that the building was closed and that it was now time to leave. When they didn't respond, Cook followed the figure, ascending the staircase it had headed towards. When he reached eye level of the floor above, he could clearly see a person blocking out one of the red floodlights which kept the fort lit at night. As Cook called out again, he noticed that this didn't look like any ordinary person. It was solid enough, but he couldn't make out any details. He described it later as a solid shadow. Now, what's more is the figure made no noise as it continued down the hallway. Cook reached for his flashlight, but by the time he flicked it on, the intruder had simply vanished. There was no way any intruder could have possibly made it to the end of the hallway so quickly. Was this the ghost of Hagee closing down the fort for the night as he so often had during his life? He has been seen on other occasions and in one instance, a park ranger had stumbled upon a reenactor in late 19th century military garb and thought little of it until he happened to find a picture of Hagee. The former caretaker's resemblance to the supposed reenactor was uncanny. Amanda McDonald was employed as a tour guide at Fort Knox in 2011. The site is an infamous maze of complex halls and alleyways, so her primary task was to familiarize herself with its layout. And one of the first places she went was Long Alley, a narrow passageway providing overwatch of the fort's dry moat. As McDonald traversed the alley, she began to feel that she wasn't alone. 
a suspicion confirmed by the sound of footsteps just behind her. And just as she turned to see who was there, well, you guessed it, something tapped her twice on the shoulder. When she looked, Long Alley was empty. McDonald found that this activity had little regard for the time of the day. Disembodied footsteps walking and running through the fort were commonplace both day and night, as were the sound of rocks being thrown or rolled, or even old muskets being fired. In one instance, the footsteps she heard above her were so forceful that they shook the dust loose from the ceiling. The sound of doors slamming perplexed her, as most, as all of them, chains shut to the walls. And as of 2013, McDonald still worked at the fort and had become an avid ghost hunter. It grew quite natural for her to spot shadows darting around corners in the darkness. And one of her favorite nightly pastimes was to watch as shapes blotted out the moonlight, streaming into the narrow windows of the office's quarters. Even though Maine's Fort Knox never saw combat, the spirits there seemed to linger on. In 1876, New Hampshire's Appalachian Mountain Club, or AMC, is America's oldest outdoor group. It originally sought to preserve and explore the White Mountains, but eventually grew throughout the entirety of the Northeast, with chapters extending as far north as Maine and as far south as Washington, D.C. The AMC maintains a hut system to shelter hikers throughout New Hampshire's White Mountains. The eastern anchor of this system is Carter Notch Hut, built in 1914. Among its first managers was Milton McGregor a friendly mountain man who was so rugged that he was almost shot on one occasion by hikers who mistook him for a wild man. McGregor, whose friends affectionately called him Red Mac, so dearly loved the area that he told them of his ultimate idea of heaven wasn't a realm in the clouds, it was Carter Notch. It seems his wish was granted. In the 1970s, the AMC had resolved to keep the huts open year-round, meaning caretakers would often have to brave New Hampshire's frigid winters all alone. In 1976, this duty fell to Joe Gill, who was stationed at Carter Notch Hut. One night in March, Gill awoke with a start as a blast of frosty late winter air lashed his face. The door to Carter Notch Hut was wide open, half asleep. Gill hoped that whatever inconsiderate hiker had arrived would soon close the door so he can get back to sleep. He snuggled deeper under his blankets, but... The moment stretched on, letting cold air into the cabin. This hiker, whoever it was, was especially rude. Not only had they left the door open, but now they were shining a flashlight in Gil's direction. Squinting through the blinding light, Gil could barely make out a darkened figure behind the light. Who is it? He finally asked. Can I help you? The figure offered no response. So Gil fumbled around for his own headlamp on the nightstand. He snapped it on place and flicked on the light, but... The room was empty. The only things out of place were the door, still ajar and his own flashlight still on, sitting on the opposite side of the room. It was in a completely different location than Gil had left it. His flashlight had never given any prior indication that it might turn on all by itself. Gil pulled himself out of bed onto the freezing floor to see if anybody had entered the cabin, but it was empty. The only other thing he discovered was another open door, but unlike the front door, it opened in the opposite direction, which would rule out the possibility of it swinging open from exponentially strong gust of wind. Gil was baffled, but managed to secure Carter Notch Hut and fall back to sleep. Towards the end of the week, Gil spent some time catching up with his AMC co-workers, and he alluded to his strange experience a few nights prior, only to find one of them perk up and ask, uh, Joe, when did you say this happened? And Joe had to think back and replied, the night of March 21st. His coworker had looked at him in shock. That was the night Red Mac died, he'd whispered. And since then, visitors to Carter Notch Hut have seen mysterious lanterns in the vicinity breaking off from the trail to wander through the woods and even hearing heavy footsteps on the roof. In late 1990s, another hut caretaker, Brian Neaton, was wrapping up his time at Carter Notch. The entire area had been blanketed in a heavy winter storm, keeping hikers away for weeks at a time. On one night, Yeaton was surprised to hear heavy footfalls tromping up the short set of stairs to the deck, but figured it was some hiker who had braved the cold and found his way to his shelter at last. He waited in the hut's dining room for over an hour, but no one ever greeted him. Yeaton was certain he had heard the footsteps, however, and even went to see where the hiker had gone. Did they turn around at the door? When he looked outside, all he found were his own set of prints. The rest of the snow remained completely untouched. 
Perhaps it was the ghost of Red Mac checking on his favorite place on Earth one last time. Simply put, Lake Champlain is massive. It borders New York, Vermont, and stretches over the Canadian border into Quebec. It is the sixth largest lake in all of the United States and was even designated one of the Great Lakes in 1998 before opposition from locals caused the legislation to be rescinded. They felt the lake was too unique to become simply another entry in a collection. This speaks not only to the independent spirit of Vermonters, but also one of Champlain's most distinctive features, the apparent presence of a monster, Champ, which hides beneath the waves believes that the lake houses an aquatic beast or even a breeding population of such creatures stretches back into the indigenous lore. The first sighting recorded by settlers comes from French cartographer Samuel de Champlain, who the lake is named after. Champlain allegedly saw a massive horse-headed serpent in the water circa 1609, and ever since, Witnesses of the unimpeachable character have stepped forward to report long-necked creatures breaching the waves. One such individual was a state park ranger, Lind Emerson. It was the summer of 1994, and Emerson, who had served as a ranger for a dozen or so years now, was stationed at Vermont's Button Bay on the shores of Lake Champlain. Emerson had looked out across the water when he noticed a peculiar wake unlike that thrown up by a passing boat. It was much too slow, much too smooth. As he squints across the waves, something seemed to pop up from the water. It looked like a single brown hump, and within moments, another hump emerged, followed by a strange head attached to a long, bumpy spine which undulated easily through the lake. The creature seemed to stretch well over 25 feet and remained, for the most part, visible for around half a minute until ducking silently back underwater. Emerson would later say he was just swimming. When that sucker popped up, by God, it was amazing. Emerson was well familiar with the flora and fauna of the lake, ruling out simple misidentification. He suspected that the population of bass, perch, and other fish, which congregate around Button Bay's warm, shallow basin, had drawn the creature in for a snack. Could this have potentially been a plesiosaur? The way I see it, he was going after a school of fish, Emerson added. And while we're on the topic of sea creatures and potentially extinct living dinosaurs, just off the coast of Massachusetts sits Pedex Island, one of the largest landmarks in Boston Harbor. Like so many other areas in the northeastern United States, it enjoys a long history stretching back into prehistory when Native Americans inhabited its 210 acres around 1634, Settlers started using Paddox Island for farming, but its proximity to the mainland made it an excellent candidate for military purposes. The island supported more than 600 militiamen stationed there during the Revolutionary War to prevent the return of British troops. And in 1904, the United States government erected Fort Andrews. Fort Andrews protected Boston until the close of World War II. Many of its buildings still stand in various states of disrepair, providing an ominous backdrop for the 2010 Martin Scorsese motion picture, Shutter Island. Today, Pedox Island in part of Boston Harbor Island's National Recreation Area, managed in part by the United States National Park Service. Massachusetts State Park Ranger Jerry McCormick has spent much of his life in around places like Pedox Island, and long before becoming a ranger himself, he would pass the hours alongside his father, who was the state supervisor for several historical locations in Boston Harbor. His childhood was spent wandering the ruins with his siblings, sometimes after dark, while his father attended to business. One night, around 10, he was wandering among the many darkened alleyways between Fort Andrews buildings, sometimes after sunset. He had found himself in the vicinity of the deserted barracks, which housed Italian prisoners of war during World War II. A sound drifted its way to McCormack on the wind that night. It wasn't recognizable at first, but soon enough, it revealed itself to be as beautiful music. It was the sound of a piano coming from the barracks. McCormack would later learn of a legend regarding one of the Italian war prisoners. The soldier would take to the fort's piano each night to serenade the other inmates. Until one night, there was no concert. The prisoner had tried to escape the island, but drowned in the icy depths of Boston Harbor. His ghost can still be heard performing on quiet nights. Today, McCormack regularly runs into the paranormal during his job. 
he has spotted a spectral lady in black pacing the walls of Fort Warren on nearby George's Island, and has even been tapped on the back while exploring the location's darkened hallways. When asked in 2016 whether or not he believed in ghosts, McCormick simply answered, You betcha, this is Bastin. Far inland, park rangers have experiences of a different variety. You see, on April 17, 1950, Earl Grant was stationed at Minichog Mountain when he saw a large silver disc leaving a contrail in the sky as it headed eastward. It ascended for seven minutes up until disappearing out of sight. As a state lookout, he had seen countless aircraft and clouds and knew this was something different. Grant said that it was definitely not an airplane or a balloon nor a helicopter or anything he has ever seen before. It had a tail, but it was not a meteor because it was moving too slowly. I would not swear it was a flying saucer, but if there are such things, that is definitely one. Follow-up from such supernatural sightings can have lifelong ramifications for park rangers. You see, in 1986, the 16-year-old Jonathan Wilk secured his dream job as a summer youth worker in National Bridge State Park for $5 an hour. Wilk spent several seasons building up seniority, eventually landing a position at Savoy Mountain State Forest, which at the time was the largest state park in all of Massachusetts. Eventually, Wilk found himself on the coveted night shift. Rangers like Wilk enjoy this quiet, mostly uneventful assignment because of the low-key nature of their duties. Their primary task is to inspect day-use areas, to ensure no rowdy, horny teenagers were visiting the park unauthorized for any debauchery parties. Wilk would always make an eight to nine mile loop on his nightly rounds, and over the course of several nights in June of 1992, he noticed one area in particular, Tannery Falls, kept having its trash can overturned. Nothing out of the ordinary, he thought, probably just a raccoon or a bear, but it was up to him to sit the trash can back up again and clean up the site. After several nights of this, the whole routine was getting old. One night, Wilk was making his rounds, enjoying a baseball game on the AM radio of his state-issued Dodge pickup truck. A storm had just passed through, and the evening air was filled with the refreshing scent of fresh rainfall and ozone. Wilk drove up to Tannery Falls, and as he pulls into the parking lot, his headlights flashed onto the 55-gallon oil drum retrofitted as the site's trash can and saw that the same thing had happened. The lid was open, allowing trash to spill out over the ground. With a sigh, Wilk pulled within 20 feet of the trash can, parking his truck. He was opening the door, bin liner in hand, when he heard a commotion off to his left. Looking up, he spotted this massive, furry form careening out of the tree line, directly towards the barrel. Wilk stood outside the open door of the truck as the beast skidded to a stop directly behind the barrel, bent its knees ever so slightly, and hoisted the entire thing in its arms. It then ran in front of his vehicle, stopping just in front of the passenger's side. As it did so, it pivoted its torso in Wilk's direction and looked at him. Its eyes were a dark orange amber color, barely illuminated by the headlights. Wilk described the creature's hair as loose and flowing to the extent he later called it pretty, almost as if it was groomed. He could tell the young animal was like that of a teenager, yet stood taller than an adult man. He stared at a Bigfoot. Movement from behind Wilk caught his attention, and the taillights of the truck had caught a second figure in their red glow, a foot or two taller than the first, and all he could make out was its silhouette. The second Bigfoot, unleashed a howl, half between a lion and a gorilla, that penetrated every fiber of the ranger's being. Wilk's fight-or-flight instincts kicked in, and he grasped hold the steering wheel, knuckles white, to drag himself back into the driver's seat. He slams the door manually, locking both it and the passenger's side before grabbing his radio. Wilk thumbed the call button, but instead of radioing for help, he simply sat there silently for 10 seconds. I mean, he couldn't even think of what to say that he needed rescuing from. What, a pair of monsters? Instead, Wilk threw the vehicle into drive, something slams into the back of the truck, and he tears out of Tannery Falls parking lot, barely letting the gas pedal off the floor until he reached the ranger station. Wilk didn't share much with his co-workers, until one night, his supervisor mentioned that he had been failing to fill out his logbook. Wilk hadn't been making the rounds as he regularly should have since his sighting. Instead of explaining what had happened, he asked to be moved back to the day shift. 
Wilkes' supervisor was puzzled as he knew the young man had always wanted to work at night, and even though he had enough seniority to stay where he was, after a moment, Wilkes' supervisor spoke up. Huh. Did you see something? And Wilk replied, Yeah, I don't want to talk about it. His supervisor's eyes grew wide. You saw it, didn't you? And he asked Wilk, who shook his head. No, I saw two of them. And Wilk's supervisor wordlessly walked over to a nearby filing cabinet, opened it, grabbed a manila folder. It was massive, maybe an inch and a half to two inches thick. He hands it to Wilk, saying, check this out. Inside was a treasure trove. Wilk was looking at at least 40 years of handwritten Bigfoot accounts. Everything from roadside crossings to ransacked camps. The earliest one Wilk saw was a photocopy from a logbook. From the looks of it, it was an old Civilian Conservation Corps report from the 1930s, stretching back to Savoy State Park's first years. The story read that two workers, Hal and Jim, were installing wooden guardrails in the park when they saw an eight-foot-tall ape man. The note in the CCC captain's handwriting concluded with a note that the workers refused to go back and finish the guardrail. The incident was a formative moment in John Wilkes' life. And not only did he feel validated, but it ignited a lifelong passion. He went on to found the Massachusetts Bigfoot Research Organization known as Squatchachusetts. Like the rest of the region, even the smallest states in northeastern America have their fair share of supernatural hotspots. Areas which overlap with state parks, Connecticut's Fort Griswold played an essential role in the early stages of the Revolutionary War, with nearly 200 deaths occurring on site. It was made a state park in 1953, and to this day, visitors and employees alike report a plethora of inexplicable activity from footprints to strange voices to shadowy figures lurking about the property, particularly in the tunnel beneath the north wall. Something throws small pebbles at anybody walking in road to the shot furnace. One of the most persistent apparitions is the ghost of a revolutionary soldier in a three-cornered hat seen by the front gate. One of the most haunted parks in Rhode Island is Colt State Park. The old farmstead, nestled on Papa Squash Neck, has a host of attractions for both fans of the outdoors and fans of the paranormal. Among the ghosts said to linger here are a pair of girls who drowned as well as the spirit of a stable worker who still terrorizes park workers. Legend holds the death occurred in the barn, which was since converted to the park office. Employees constantly have to deal with lights turning off and on by themselves, doors slamming, and items constantly being misplaced. When most Americans think of New York, their minds immediately go to this vast, booming metropolis of New York City. The state, however, is filled with broad tracts of rural land and majestic forest, after California, New York holds the record for the most state parks. In fact, there are 215 state parks and 24 national parks protected, both the Empire State's historical sites and its impressive wilderness areas. Among them is the Allegheny State Park, which famously holds a paranormal reputation. Few know this lore better than the Seneca storyteller, Duane Deuce Bowen, who has collected his people's myths and legends over the course of a lifetime. Myths and legends which bleed into waking reality. These include stories of gigantic snakes and talking animals which walk on their hind legs, large hairy ape men and the cannibal giant known as the Hi-Hat, who apparently wanders the marshes and traces the shadowed creeks. Hi-Hat is a humanoid being who looks quite similar to a man. He is said to be tall and sporting a gruff voice and rows of sharp teeth. On his head, he wears a tall stovepipe hat giving him his name. Allegheny State Park is also home to Witchlight Hill, or Gahai Hill in the Seneca tongue. The hill takes its name from the mysterious lights which dance around it at night. Bowen and the others, including numerous hikers and rangers, have all seen them. Witnesses describe the lights bobbing along the hillside, through fields and on or even the river. Legend holds anyone who draws near enough to these witch lights might even spot spectral faces inside. Nearby, a pathway commonly known as Witch's Walk earned a reputation for hauntings so terrifying the only people who dared to venture there at night were witches and sorcerers. Some Seneca believe this is due to an ancient battle which took place along the route. Maybe witch lights and UFOs are one and the same. A little over a hundred miles east of the Allegheny State Park is a 29-year-old forest ranger 
who spotted a shape like a glowing lens above Addison, New York on April 23rd, 1953. You see, it was almost one in the morning and the young ranger had been looking out of his watchtower window when something caught his eye. It was a flash of light traveling across the horizon at breakneck speeds. It almost resembled an enormous silver dollar and illuminated the ground as it moved and then passed in front of some darker clouds before soaring into the west. Another ranger had a chilling story to share. It was January of 1990, and he had received a call about a man in distress in the parking lot at the base of Nina Mountain near Kent. The ranger arrived on the scene to discover a person splayed out on the hood of a car. He rescued the man who told a peculiar story once he was revived at the ranger station. Now, according to the witness, he had reached the top of the mountain and foolishly had not dressed for the cold wintry gales that awaited him on the summit. He had become disoriented and numb and soon resigned himself to the fact that he would most likely die of hypothermia. As he lay on the ground, the sky darkened but soon gave way to ten multicolored lights in the shape of a circle above. The lights gradually approached him and either did make a sound or couldn't be heard above the whipping wind. The next thing he remembered was regaining consciousness in the ranger station, with only vague memories of a darkened room filled with canisters and strange people. How he somehow wound back up in the parking lot was a mystery. His rescuer, nor any of the other rangers, knew what to do with his story. And according to the tale, the last thing anybody saw of this witness was in 2006, when he left a cryptic note for his sister, stating that she shouldn't worry about him and that he was moving away. After that, Nobody saw him again. It was as if he had vanished off the face of the earth. Like New York, New Jersey often brings to mind urban centers rather than uninhabited countryside. In reality, over half the state's land is protected from development, including two million acres of forest. New Jersey actually enjoys a strong Bigfoot tradition. One of the most famous examples is that of the Big Red Eye a name which stuck after retired park ranger Tom Card's encounter nearly four decades ago. Card had been patrolling along New Jersey's Kittatinny Ridge when he heard something horrific from the trees. I've spent my whole life in the woods and I've never heard anything like that, he later said. When I first heard it, I thought it was a siren in the distance, but then I heard it again and I saw two guys running down the road. I was like, this isn't good. The men were a pair of park rangers themselves, and both were armed. Whatever they had encountered, they were unwilling to share. But strange creatures are not confined to northern New Jersey. Nearly a quarter of a century later, John Irwin, another park ranger, was traveling through Wharton State Forest along the Mullica River when his vehicle's headlights caught something from another world in their beams. As it stepped out from the forest into the open night air, Irwin could see that the figure was over six feet tall and covered in dark, nasty matted hair. The creature took several steps before stopping in the middle of the road, blocking Irwin's path and forcing him to stop his car. The two stared at each other for several more moments, the ranger transfixed by its glowing red eyes, before it continued across the road into the woods. It sounds like a classic Bigfoot encounter, except for a few peculiar details that Irwin mentioned. The manner in which the creature moved seemed stiff, almost robotic, and not at all fluid like a natural creature. Its head did not resemble an ape, but rather that of a deer. And most bewilderingly, the Bigfoot seemed to completely lack any arms whatsoever. It only had a pair of massive muscular legs, so whether it was simply keeping its arms by its side or was actually armless is anyone's guess. Despite how outlandish his encounter was, Irwin still filed an official report with the park ranger's office. Did Irwin encounter a robo deerman amputee? Over the years, researchers have tried to cram his sighting into a number of categories, from Bigfoot to Dogman. And in truth, his sighting more closely resembles the Jersey Devil, a legend turned cryptid whose origins stretch back to the early 1700s. According to one version of the tale, a woman named Jane Leeds, a resident of New Jersey's infamous Pine Barrens, was giving birth to her 13th child. The labor was so painful that she cursed the infant and it emerged as a true monstrosity. A hoofed creature with a bat's wings and the head of a goat or horse, depending on interpretation, the Jersey Devil has been sighted on and off ever since, including a rash of sightings in 1909. And since then, 
accounts have been more sporadic, but plenty of people today believe that the creature still calls the eerie forest of New Jersey its home. Even in a region as mired in high strangeness as the northeastern United States, Pennsylvania may have the greatest number of paranormal accounts. The state has seen a massive number of UFO and Bigfoot reports, sometimes together as in the famous 1970s sightings recorded by researcher Stan Gordon and has a deep history of lending itself to innumerable ghost sightings. The hauntings reported by park rangers at Gettysburg National Military Park could also fill their own episode, so we'll save those for later. Instead, we end our tour of the ranger sightings in the northeastern United States with a story of Bigfoot in Pennsylvania. In October of 2007, a park ranger was patrolling maintenance back roads in Parker Dam State Park. As he neared the intersection of Mud Run Road and Tyler Road, he spots a tall, shaggy form standing upright on the opposite side of the road in the meadow. The figure, which the ranger assumed was a black bear, had its back towards the road and was pulling branches toward its mouth, stripping away leaves or berries. The ranger stops his vehicle, grabs his camera, and begins quietly making his way across the field for a closer look. And as he did so, the creature turns, shuffling down a nearby embankment on its hind legs, which seemed far too long to belong to a bear. The ranger felt he could perhaps frame a better shot from the top of the embankment, so when he reached the position, the animal was still lurking beneath, but rapidly shot away on all fours the moment he arrived. As it disappeared into the bramble, the ranger was able to tell that the creature had a reddish sheen to its hair, another attribute which seems to rule out a black bear. The ranger remained agnostic about what he had seen, but still filed a report with the Pennsylvania Bigfoot Society, later sharing photographs of deer carcasses he had stumbled upon later in the area. All of their necks had been broken, and something had ripped massive holes in their abdomens. Even though we tend to think of the northeastern United States as highly urbanized, plenty of undeveloped land still exists. Here, in these corners of the countryside, protected by state and national parks, rangers have constantly found themselves stumbling into the unknown, and it seems likely they will continue to do so in the future. If you guys enjoyed today's episode, be sure to go ahead and leave a comment down below and smack that like button. And also, if you're new to the channel and you enjoy the content, be sure to go ahead and smack the subscribe button and keep your notifications turned on so that way YouTube will let you know every time I release a great new video. As always, guys, I love all of you so much. Thank you for watching and supporting. Keep an open mind, and I will see all of you guys in the very next video.